Kathy, you have a new mic. I do. I'm excited. Now we have the same one. And it hopefully won't pick up any squeaky chairs or <laughs> frogs. I miss the frogs. They were yeah, relaxing. I, I mean, it's not mating season for the frogs, so... <laughs> They're tired from it now. Well, we're going to talk about episode four in Sheep's Clothing. Should we do the out-of-context summary? Let's do it. In this episode, we find the world's most unconcerned cab driver. Crane continues to compound on his Ichibod Crane ways, and it seems like Colin and Swineheart might have some beef. All right, so in our opening scene, Dr. Swineheart mends Bigby while a worried Snow and Colin watch. Snow is intent on bringing order to Fabletown, but Colin points out some flaws in the system. So my first note is just, the doctor is really calm about how difficult treating Bigby is. He says, you're testing even my skills here. And that is absolutely not something you want to hear from your doctor. And then can we talk about how disgusting his arm is? Oh my gosh, you're freaking out <laughs> when we were watching that scene. Just because it's, it's not an accurate representation, but it is pretty gory in a very cartoonish way. It's accurate enough <laughs> for your brain to fill in the blanks. It's enough to make you squeamish. Yeah, and I played it and then edited it and then rewatched it with you. And I was tired of seeing it. You were suffering. And then when I was playing, I couldn't like look at it. I was trying to avoid it as much as possible so that I missed the triangle prompt when we were trying to set the bone. <laughs> you were struggling there. It's gross. But then, yeah, Swineheart leaves and he says bye to everyone and turns to Colin and says, Colin. Colin in response goes, Swiney, I want to know what the background of their beef is. How did it begin, and why are they still so mad? Well, are they both, like, the well, one's a pig, obviously. Is the other, like, a descendant <laughs> of the pig, like, swine, so, like, swineheart, and then one's an actual pig? Are they related through some ancestor, or I'm curious, too. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I picked up on the pig theme as well. Yes. Um, let me just Google it. I'm not finding any answers so far. Oh, I think I found something. Although this article does not cite any sources, so <laughs> this might not be accurate. But here's what I'm finding. He was one of three traveling army surgeons who performed surgery on themselves to impress an innkeeper. Um, okay. And after removing their own organs, they put them back in the morning. One cut off his hand, one cut out his heart, and the other removed his own eyes. So... That's intense. So, I, I mean, that's pretty impressive, I guess, to cut out your own, whichever one he was, body part, and then put it back the next day and not die in between. <laughs> um, but I found no connections to a pig, so the beef is still a mystery. I'm curious. I kind of like Colin as a character. He's just, he's sassy, and that's really what my, my next note is about, just how Colin speaks up for Big B, and it's so nice to have that kind of friend when he knows Big B enough that Big B is probably not going to step up and defend himself. Mm -hmm. Especially against Snow. Right? Yeah, and so you have Colin who's also looking out for his friend for his best interests, and so I, I appreciate that from him. And this is when Snow is sort of trying to lay down the law and kind of, I don't know, she, well, she says... What you turned into last night, it can't happen again. And Colin's response is, we need monsters to fight monsters. And Bigby's response is, what did you expect me to do? And that's a, that's a fair question. Like, they might all be dead if he hadn't <laughs> turned into a giant wolf. That's exactly what my note is. Is that, why is Snow against this? Like, rules are there for a reason. Kind of like, that kind of information. And you're wondering what in the past caused her to be such a rule follower. But... At the same time, it is a really fair point that they're doing what they're supposed to do. And that's like suppressing your, for them, their natural instincts of transforming to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And it also protects other people. Like Snow would have died had Bigby not done what he's doing. And yet she's criticizing him. Yeah. Do you think she's just concerned that he doesn't have control over it? I don't think that. I feel like it's more of an image kind of thing. Bigby held himself pretty well and he wasn't out like destroying everyone so that's my question is why is snow so against him transforming is it about the appearance or is it 
a fear of him either harming himself or harming others? Or is it about him being a bad influence to other people who can transform? Like, it's not about him losing control. It's about him doing something and the other people think, oh, I can do that too. And then Mm -hmm. it's the other people that are going to lose control. Yeah, I can see all of that because Mm -hmm. we know how important the glamours are so that the normal people Mm -hmm. don't see these insane creatures and then they have to flee somewhere else. But yeah, it seems like after what she saw, Mm -hmm. that she'd be a little more understanding, but it seems like she's still just trying to fix all of Crane's mistakes, and she seems Mm -hmm. desperate. I think she knows that they're kind of losing respect from all the other citizens. But speaking about Colin, (laughs) if we can backtrack for Mm -hmm. a minute, when Snow and Big Bear are in his kitchen, well, first of all, she admits that she's worried about him. She says, you had us worried, and then there's an arm touch. So... Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> then Colin walks in and they're so annoyed at him he interrupted their romantic moment in the dingy kitchen did not read the room at all mm-hmm. is Snow realizing like one Bigby's not invincible and two that she cares about him more than she thought she did I think so I think it was just like a moment of being very vulnerable and transparent with your feelings and she just wanted to acknowledge that but then you turn around and then she's back to her assertive self the rest of the, the episode. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're kind of wondering, is it just like a moment kind of thing or is it going to turn into something more? I don't know if she sees it as a weakness, especially because they work together mm-hmm. to, to have feelings. But whatever it is, I think Colin sort of annoys her back into her normal ways of trying to be professional. And then they start talking about what is the plan. And Colin asks, do you even have a plan? And who should I be asking? And this is similar to something we heard last episode when Snow says sometimes it's fuzzy in response to someone asking, oh, you're in charge now. People don't know who is even leading them anymore. Is it Snow or is it Bigby? Should Snow continue trying to set rules even though it's going to piss people off? Is that kind of behavior going to continue to earn respect or is it going to make people see her as the next crane how do you proceed in that kind of situation do you become rule setting and enforcing people to follow or do you become a more collaborative leader in letting people express their concerns colin sort of calls her out on that too he gets told again to get a glamour or he'll be sent to the farm um Mm -hmm. and he's like okay but With what money am I going to get a glamour? I don't even have thumbs. I can't work. Mm -hmm. So he's pointing out sort of a major flaw in the system that not all of these fables are even capable of acquiring any means to follow the rules that have been set. And I don't think Snow has noticed that or realized that until this point. At some point, they're talking about the crooked man, and Snow says, what does he even want out of all this? He has to be more than just a loan shark. Control power whether it's actually deserved or if it's just perceived power Mm -hmm. and snow goes on to say this war has been going on for years we just haven't noticed it so i think he has been just slowly chipping away at the leadership of fable town and sort of shifting everyone over to his side and i think yeah it is about control what he wants out of the control we don't know probably money he's definitely up to something are we ready for scene one Mm mm-hmm all right Big me meet. Ugh. (laughs) I should have done a warm up. (laughs) Okay. Big B meets with Nerissa in his office, who is able to point him in the direction of Beauty and Beast. We learn more about the magic behind the ribbon the girls wear on their necks. So it's just like an observation about Nerissa, but I feel like she knows more than what people think she knows. And it's Mm -hmm. not just even about her, but it's about all the other girls. They know a lot more because of the people coming to them are probably spilling secrets and and they know they can't talk yeah and so then you have the issue of how do they communicate that to big b and it sucks that people think that they're like oh they're just kind of like part of the wall part of the background we don't need to worry about them maybe it's a good thing that they're blending in with the background so much so then they can share that information when the time comes Yeah, it's pretty demeaning, but at the same time, they're being underestimated. And we're definitely seeing that with Nerissa because this is the second time 
she's given him vital information. Mm -hmm. So we talked about in the first episode about that weird chemistry with Bigby and Faith. And I feel like there's something similar here with Nerissa. Did you pick up on that? I felt that too. And I don't think it's about the person, but the ribbon. I feel like the ribbon holds something more. I don't know exactly what it is, but I do think it's the person who wears a ribbon kind of is enchanted to act a certain way. Like asking, mm -hmm. do you like this ribbon? Yeah. And both of them say the same thing. I think it's the ribbon making the person, the owner, say that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I definitely picked up on that. They both asked if he likes it. And there are some weird mm -hmm. similarities between them. So, yeah, I think the question is, why? <laughs> What's causing it? Mm -hmm. So, at some point, Bigby smokes a cigarette. And Narissa says, not many people smoke those. So... She's not. <laughs> she seems like mm -hmm. she's not involved. Remember, we found that pack of Huff and Puffs. Was mm -hmm. that the crime scene or in... It was at the crime scene, right? I don't know if it was. I can't remember. I need to look now. But I also think that this brand is going to be a big deal. Whether it's some kind of incriminating evidence or someone's going to try to frame Big B. But I do think it's going to be part of the evidence or a way to solve the identity of who the murderer is. Yeah, agreed. I know we've been keeping track of like who isn't disgusted by them. Mm-hmm. Okay. I found it. Okay. So there's an ashtray in the room where Faith was murdered, and there's a cigarette there. Bigby sniffs it and says it's a huff and puff. And Beauty responds, I thought you were the only one who smoked that crap brand. So we're looking for people who don't react disgusted around a huff and puff and i don't think we've noticed any yet i mean but here's the thing we know that what's the name woody mm -hmm. uh i think he's grabbed a cigarette from him from big b so he doesn't act disgusted well he he takes one later this episode he takes it but he says shitty brand okay so i don't think he would choose it so i don't gotcha. think we can rule him out for this but i don't think he's our, like, number one. Mm hmm So Nerissa talks a lot about friends, and she is almost kind of hinting, which Bigby picks up on, that his friends might be in danger. And then later she says, can you keep this conversation between us? It makes me wonder, is someone close to Bigby on the inside of this? Like Bluebeard, maybe? We know he burnt evidence, and he's... Not a f necessarily a friend of Bigby's, but he's close to him. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know who either, but it has to be someone that Nerissa knows is a friend of Bigby. And then we learn, which we've speculated before, that the girls die if their ribbons are removed. It basically mm -hmm. cuts their heads off, and that's how Bigby says Faith and Lily died. Do you think Faith and Lily died because someone was trying to get information out of them. They're trying to get them to talk and they took the ribbon off thinking that that would solve it and they just died. Was it more manslaughter than murder? I mean, what do you think? The other theory is that they took it off themselves because they didn't want to continue. And so... Um, Except for Faith, I don't think could have because her head was placed. Unless she had someone do it for her. Yeah. <laughs> Lily could have done it, I guess. Yeah. Or Nerissa. I don't know. I... I I do feel like that's quite the stretch. The other third theory, I think it's someone intentionally wanted to kill them and decided that they know mm -hmm. taking the ribbon off will kill them, so they're going to go with that route. Yeah, I think it's either intentional murder or manslaughter because they were trying to, to get information out of them. Um, That's all my notes for the scene. Do you have any more? Nope. All right, scene two. Bigby arrives at Beauty and Beast's apartment where Beauty asks for his help dealing with the Crooked Man. They give Bigby some locations to check out where he might catch onto the trail of the Crooked Man. <laughs> My first note is just, Beast is being such a butt face. He is arguing with Beauty and she says that she trusts Bigby and he goes, Oh, of course you do. He was keeping secrets for you. But was he? Mm -mm. Because I kept choosing to not get involved. I didn't know what her secret was. Barely before Beast knew about it. I think Beast is just taking it out on her. I don't think there's more to it. I feel like that was just a pretty shallow statement that exactly. he said out of 
anger. Right. He's being a butt face. It just seems like in general, all the fables are struggling, whether Mm -hmm. it's with like money. Obviously, it's all with money issues. So I'm curious what happened to make them all struggle with money. Yeah. And then that raises a good question because with Colin, we know he can't make money. But Bigby sort of is irritated at Beauty and Beast because their apartment is so fancy. And it sounds like they took out the loan just to be able to keep up that lifestyle. So did they really even need it to survive or was it just to to be comfortable? I had a question. Do you think Faith and Lily were killed because they had debt? We know that Lily had debt. Holly says as much. But it seems like Georgie takes in women with debt. In Beauty's file in the Tweedle's office, there's a note saying Georgie has an interest. So do you think all these women are indebted to the crooked man who then Georgie takes in as strippers or prostitutes to get what they're owed? I think part of it is also they're taking advantage of when they transition to moving into from the force or wherever they were into the city. They couldn't like easily adapt to their new lifestyle. And I do think that it might have been a way just to kind of get control over them. Saying that, oh, just like take out a loan. I'll help you out. So you can slowly right. transition. They just pretty much preyed on these people to make sure that they go in debt. And then follow up question. Do you think this has been what Lawrence has been talking about when he says, I didn't try to stop it and that kind of thing? Is he talking about Faith taking out a loan and then having to go into prostitution to pay it off? I think so. I think it might even go before earlier that couldn't stop like living so glamorously and then my last note as bigby's leaving beast asks him once you find the crooked man can you dot 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 help us out and i chose to not respond because i was so mad at Mm -hmm. beast still (laughs) but what do you think they're asking him to do here uh kill him and erase their files yeah (laughs) agreed only issue with that is later Snow asks Bigby to bring him back alive, so... I feel like Bigby's not going to kill someone if he doesn't need to. He already has enough hate from people that he doesn't need to do <laughs> more to potentially anger someone. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. People say they're scared of him, but then they ask him to do things like this. It's sort of a double standard. You are a hypocrite. Yeah. Everyone's like a hypocrite there. They, they're scared of him, but they want him to do their dirty work for him. That's not fair. Mm-mm, not at all. All right, scene three. Mm-hmm. Bigby arrives at the butcher shop where we learn the owner was strong-armed out of his business by Bloody Mary and Company. Bigby discovers the crooked man is dealing in black market magic. I might have said crooked funny, but we're going to just mm. accept it. My first note is I love making Bigby say nothing because it makes the characters that he's interacting with so uncomfortable. And we see that with Johan the butcher, he just keeps rambling on and on and starts to sound like an idiot. It's also it's a, a good, good way to get more information out of them to just let them keep talking. I was just about to say that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. So once they make it into this secret room where the magic is being produced, Johan asks Bigby, where were you when they took this from me? That's just another example of how leadership has been failing the citizens of Fable Town. I don't know if there's any more to say about that. <laughs> I don't know what else to say <laughs> either. <laughs> so there's a couple chalkboards. One is orders and one is ingredients. And there's a few names we recognize on the board, but the first one I want to talk about is Auntie Greenleaf. Do you think she was working for the Crooked Man or just getting her supplies from him? I think based on everyone's experience, she probably has something that he's holding on to and that's why... She's complicit. The names we recognize on this orders board are Auntie Greenleaf, Georgie, Faith, Lily, Nerissa. Each of these names has letters next to them, which, if you look, (laughs) it's pretty clear that these are abbreviations for ingredients. So I wrote down all the ingredients (laughs) for everyone. For Georgie, there is K, K, F, F, and E, E. FF was pretty clearly tongue of dog, and EE was pretty clearly swine's snout. And then KK, you couldn't see the start of it, but I'm pretty sure it says wolfsbane. 
So I don't know what these make, but there's two that have to do with dogs. And since Bigby's kind of like a dog, I'm wondering if it has something to do with like throwing him off a scent or something. I don't know. I might be reaching, but I feel like there's clues here. I don't know either, but I, I also feel like something is probably going to tie back to Colin too, just because right. he's a pig. <laughs> And then something else interesting I noticed, Faith, Lily, and Nerissa, they all have three ingredients, and all three of them, two of them are the same, J and DD. J is Dragon's Wart, and DD is Star of the North. I don't know what that means. Me neither. But it seems like there's clearly something pretty similar with these three characters and whatever magic they're getting. Mm Mm-hmm. My other note for this scene is just about all this information. Do you think it's going to make a difference to the overall case of solving who's been doing the murdering? Or do you think it's just going to... Is it linear? Like, because he has to solve this, then he'll be able to solve the murder? That's a good question. I don't know that it directly correlates to solving the murder, except that Johan then points him in the direction of the lucky pawn. Mm -hmm. But Beauty already talked about that. But it does sort of, it gives you information to better understand the Crooked Man and this whole operation and everything that's going on in Fable Town. So I think mm-hmm. it it makes more sense of everything that's going on, but it doesn't necessarily solve it. Unless there really are clues hidden in these letters. Mm-hmm. I'm not convinced that these are just random. Anything else? Nope. Classic Kathy Nope. All right, scene four summary. After leaving the butcher shop, Bigby heads to the Lucky Pond where Woody is looking for his stolen axe. We meet the Jersey Devil, a member of the Crooked Man's gang, and a fight breaks out. Once the dust settles, Bigby finds Crane Coat with the missing shard from the magic mirror safely inside. I'm trying to not kill people, so I intentionally <laughs> like miss a few QTEs here because I'm trying to not kill this guy. I mean, he seems like a bad person, but we don't know that much about him. I didn't feel like he deserved to have his head chopped off by a security gate. But also, Woody and Bigby are teaming up now. That's a change. I kind of like that change. I think Woody appreciated that for once. It seemed like after Lily's murder, Woody sort of, I don't know, got more in touch with reality and who's on what side and who the good guys are. My next note is about the picture of snow in crane's pocket can you just stop guy what a creep right it's so disturbing here's the other thing is this is the same picture that was in the glamour tube so did he take it after they found it i wouldn't be surprised he took it back he has a problem obviously a huge problem ikibod crane just does not know how to quit and it seems like the jersey devil is on bloody mary's payroll and then my next note goes down to after the fight okay same here my next note is jersey's quote of i don't know what they did but if they're dead it's because the crooked man wanted them dead talking about faith and lily and we know that they knew something because crane was trying to get information out of them and then he also says he's not in your town you're in his So that's pretty telling as well. It's clear that there's a lot of people who are on the Crooked Man's side, or even if they're not on his side, they're being controlled by him now. Woody's mentioning the cigarette brand again. It's starting to become more and more frequent that someone's pointing it out. Yeah, we've had at least three people say, that's a crap brand. So it seems Mm -hmm. very purposeful. Otherwise, why do we keep saying this? My next note is, Bigby looks like he just killed someone. There's blood splattered all over him. (laughs) And then he just hails a cab, and they pull right over and just let him in. I would never stop for someone looking like that. What is wrong with this cab driver? He probably has picked up Bigby enough to know that's very normal for him (laughs) to be wearing someone else's blood. Fair enough. Um, But also, can you just walk around the city with an axe flung over your shoulder? That seems like that's not okay either. Well, I mean, considering how it's kind of hard to kill a fable, I feel like it's pretty normal. It's not like one chop is going to kill you. Well, but we're in New York. There's still normal people around. It seems like maybe you should have 
at least tried to hide it under your shirt or something? I mean, if you saw that, would you be the one who goes and speaks up? If I saw it, I would be minding my own business. I wouldn't say something, but I would definitely cross the street through traffic to avoid walking Same past here. <laughs> Same here. All right, moving on to scene five. With the shard in his possession, Bigby returns to the business office to find Toad and Bluebeard getting into it with Snow and with each other. Buffkin mends the magic mirror, which reveals Crane is alive and being sent far away. We also see the location of the Crooked Man's store, and Bigby rushes to find it before it moves again. First question is that when they're looking at the shard and Buffkin saying that he needed to uh, kind of coax the, the mirror, what is Buffkin's relationship with the guy in the mirror? And two, when Buffkin seemed like he was struggling to fit that last piece of the mirror, it almost made me think that there's a second mirror. And could there be a second mirror out there? So I think to answer the first part of your question, I think Buffkin is sort of like the librarian of the business office. Mm -hmm. So he just knows a lot of information. And then to... (laughs) And then to answer the second part of your question... It seems hinted at that since Bloody Mary was near this shard of the mirror, the rest of the mirror was rejecting it. And then we get some confirmation when they spy on Crane and Bloody Mary's there, and then she seems to know that they're watching her through the mirror. And she sort of attacks it in some way, and the mirror's like, mm-hmm. okay, can we please like not? But then Bigby questions Bluebeard about burning Crane's possessions, and he responds that he was keeping things out of the light that had to do with snow do we buy this excuse no (laughs) yeah and bigby doesn't either it's clear he's hiding something and we still don't know what it is but he was burning evidence so maybe he is on the inside and maybe that's who nerissa didn't want finding out about that conversation so my next note is just well poop crane is alive (laughs) i was really hoping that we'd get to do a so long for crane but it seems he's just being sent far away he probably still has value in oh, yeah. like, blackmail or whatever. Or he holds a lot of good information that they need for now. Exactly. Okay, final scene then. Mm-hmm. Bigby makes it to the Crooked Man's door in time and enters to find Tiny Tim on the other side, who escorts him to the Crooked Man and his inner circle. So when Bigby gets to the door, he kicks it open, so he's really close to it. And then suddenly he's like 20 feet away from it. And runs in. How did he get back so far? I feel like the entering the door is like a portal or something like that. So you have that. I don't know. I because <laughs> he like shot backwards or something. Yeah, I I can't explain what what was going on. It was weird. I had to point it out. And then he gets through the door, and this is when we meet Tiny Tim, who says that the Crooked Man helped him out and drops some hints that he's helped out a lot of other people as well. Okay, I had to pause. <laughs> I had to go back after we watched this together mm-hmm. because I wasn't sure if I was hearing this right. But when we get to the outside of the door, we hear, I'm pretty sure it's Jersey laughing. And you hear Georgie talking to him and he says, am I some kind of joke to you? What did I tell you? And then it sounds like he starts to say, stop laughing at me. Hmm. And if you remember... This is what Toad Jr. heard. Oh. Oh, yeah. Do we need to play this audio real quick? Yeah, can we? Can we? Yeah. It's hard to hear, so we might need to listen to it a couple times, but. Okay. That's just a good point. I'm curious. All right. I'm going to turn up my volume, so don't yell at me or else I'll scream. Okay. (laughs) So listen very carefully. (laughs) Why some kind of a fucking joke to you? What did I tell you? Tell me who the fuck is back there. Did you hear it? Go back one more. (laughs) I think I did. Can you go back just a little bit? (laughs) Am I some kind of a fucking joke to you? What did I tell you? eh? Tell me who the fuck is back there. Yeah, I heard it. You're right. That's actually a really good observation. Good job. (laughs) Thank you. As soon as I heard the laugh, I was like, oh, (laughs) someone's laughing. That was one of our things to keep track of. So, I mean... I, Sounds like he I at mean, least helped dump the bodies. Or the well, we body. we kind of know that the Crooked Man is involved, but we didn't know if it's within his inner circle that is also involved. And to what extent? Right. We don't know yet. But it's... At least we kind of, like, 
zoomed in on where exactly Bigby should focus his attention. Exactly. That was a pretty good clue. And that's why I feel mm-hmm. like the cigarettes is a clue, too, and that will come around at some point. Mm-hmm. we got to keep on it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And then he also listens in from behind the door on the Crooked Man talking, and it sounds like he's trying to win over Bigby. He says, mm-hmm. you needn't worry, he'll come around, and like Crane before him, I'm sure he'll prove to be quite useful. So he's got plans, and he's trying to manipulate and control people. That is confirmed in this moment. We see his inner circle, which... It's the Tweedles, Jersey, Georgie, and then the blonde Puddin' and Pie Girl. So, like, within this group of people, are these everyone involved at, like, in terms of, like, having the power to choose what's going to happen or stuff? Or are they just all there and they just take order? Like, can these people think for themselves? It's a good question. I don't know. And Bloody Mary is not there. Mm -hmm. Does that show that she maybe has a higher degree of freedom than they do, and that's why she's not there. But based off of the Jersey's comments, the Jersey Devil's comments, it sounds like he is top authority, and he is still Mm -hmm. in control. We don't know to what extent these people are Mm -hmm. involved with him, but they certainly seem like he has some degree of trust in them. And that's it for me. All right. Well, the cigarette count. Your guess was three. Do you want to guess what it actually was? Oh my gosh. Wasn't it like five? It was six. Oh. So so your guess of eight from last time was actually not so bad. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Final episode guess. I'm going to say... Wait, is this for all smokers or just Big B smoking? It's just Big B. I'd say about... Let's do six again. Okay. I'm writing it down. Locked in. Anything else or should we close it out? Let's close it out. Okay, we're going to be posting episode 5 gameplay, which we'll be discussing next week. And is that all we say? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. It's the last episode of Wolf Among Us. It's the last episode. We'll find out who the killer is, but will we find out why? There might still be some mysteries. My voice cracked. Are we ready to count it off? Yes, let's count it off. Voice recorder first. On one. Three, two, one.